today to have the privilege of uh, talking with you about uh, uh, your many uh, contributions to uh, science and society uh, in general. And I would hope that we would make this a very uh, informal uh, exchange. And uh, I would like, however, to point out that uh, uh, this is uh, a start of a series that we're going to be doing with the cooperation of the National Academy of Engineering. And uh, we hope to uh, have these uh, in the archives uh, for future uh, historians, and uh, we hope also that several universities uh, will use these perhaps for educational purposes. And so with this brief introduction, I would just like to uh, have you uh, start and tell us a little about uh, your background and what led you uh, into the uh, field of uh, science, uh, uh, where you made such tremendous contributions. Well, I was uh, born in Portland, Oregon. Uh, my father was a druggist. Uh, my father was born in Missouri of German ancestry, and my mother was born in Oregon, Lone Rock, Oregon, of uh, English and Scottish ancestry. And uh, I, I started to school in a small town in eastern Oregon. Condon, Oregon. I was just interested to notice the other day that uh, in 1906, I was going to school in Condon, and there was another boy there, somewhat over, going to school, William P. Murphy, who received the Nobel Prize in Medicine a number of years later. So we were in this small town of 500. It, well, I'm certain, still 500 population. I'm amazed Oregon. when you mention something like that because I became interested several years ago uh, in such uh, coincidences or whatever you call it, in that uh, uh, there have been certain small towns uh, where uh, a number of uh, uh, a number of uh, people uh, have come to make make tremendous uh, contributions. I think. Uh, there was a small town in uh, uh, in South Dakota where E. O. Lawrence was born. Oh, yes. and John Lawrence, and uh, yes. there were uh, there were several other very prominent uh, scientists that came from there. And then, of course, I think you're all familiar with the uh, with uh, what is it, uh, Budapest in, in Hungary, uh, yes. where uh, uh, people like uh, Wigner von von Neumann. So I'm delighted to hear that. Uh, uh, that there is another example of a small town uh, yes. where there's a, like a real concentration. Yes. Well, my father, mother, and uh, my two sisters, a little younger than I, and I moved to Portland, uh, where he continued working as a druggist, but then he died suddenly, my father, when I was nine years old. So, although uh, I have some memories of him, and I... I think to some extent he influenced my life in these early years. Uh, I don't uh, remember very much. Uh, I do know that he uh, was very much interested in the fact that uh, I was a good student and uh, an omnivorous reader and apparently a thoughtful boy. Even when I was nine years old, he recognized that uh, uh, I had a special interest in learning. Well, when I was 10, 11, when I was 11, I became interested in insects, and I got books from the library, read about insects and collected insects. Then when I was 12, I got interested in minerals. I again got books from the library, read them, and uh, made tables yeah. for my own use and uh, made some effort to collect minerals, not very successfully because I didn't have transportation in the Willamette Valley. Isn't a good uh, uh, place, especially a good place for finding minerals. Then when I was 13 and in high school, my second year in high school, a uh, boy my own age, 
Lloyd Jeffress said to me as we were walking home one day, uh, would you like to see some chemical experiments? And I said, yes, and he said, come on in. We went in his home. He was an only child. And, uh, went up to his room, and he carried out some experiments, which uh, impressed me immensely. I, w I became very enthusiastic about chemistry. That same day, I found a book that had belonged to my father on uh, elementary chemistry and read it, and I uh, even repeated a couple of experiments using materials around the house. Uh, and from then on, I think I uh, was a chemist. Were you able to uh, take chemistry course, a chemistry course in high school then, or was it yes. uh, a formal course? The next year, I had the year of chemistry, high school chemistry, and followed that by a half a year of physics. But also, the chemistry teacher, William B. Green, in Washington School in Portland, then uh, gave me special supervision the following year. Uh, so I continued to carry out experiments in the uh, high school laboratory, and I stayed after school on certain days and helped him operate a bomb calorimeter to determine the uh, heating heat value of the coal and oil used in the Portland schools. Yes, well, that's a very that so job. sophisticated experiment for high school. Yes, well, uh, I was much impressed by it. Mr. Green, this teacher, in fact, uh, was much impressed by something that had happened. The physics teacher, whom I admired, uh, I think he was very good, too, had uh, worked out equations for Mr. Green uh, showing how he should correct for the heat loss. And this struck him as being something unusual that would be possible to carry out a theoretical treatment of that problem. So uh, I left after three and a half years without my high school degree because I had begun in the middle of the, the year in February and the, the Oregon Agricultural College didn't like students to come in the middle of the year. They preferred them to come in September. I, I didn't want to miss a year for that reason. So and I had enough credits to be admitted to Oregon State even though I didn't have a high school diploma. So I went to Oregon State to study chemical engineering. Uh, an interesting event had happened about a year before. This young man, uh, a boy at my age, Lloyd Jeffress, uh, got his PhD in psychology, ultimately, at Berkeley, and uh, became the head of the psychology department in Austin, Texas. But at this time, when we were 15, my grandmother in Oswego said to me one day, Line, what are you going to be when you grow up? I said, I'm going to be a chemical engineer. Uh, Lloyd Jeffress immediately said, no, he's going to be a professor. <laughs> oh, that's very interesting. I studied chemical engineering at Oregon State. First, I studied at Oregon State because of not having any money. It was the cheapest yeah. place for me to go. The Reed College was only a couple of <coughs> a couple of miles from where my mother lived. But uh, uh, it, well, first I knew that you had to pay tuition at Reed, and uh, it didn't seem there was much chance of my going there. But also, I didn't know that there was any profession that would involve chemistry except chemical engineering. Oh yes, of course be, that, uh, I, that was a natural thing to do, but of course uh, usually the chemical engineering courses have been very vigor, uh, rigorous in getting a good background in fundamental chemistry and analytical chemistry. And yes. So you, you, yes. Uh, you well, of course, at this time, 60, nearly 70 years ago, 65 years ago, uh, the chemical engineering was uh, to a much greater extent 
the taught in a practical way. Oh, yeah. The first two years, mm -hmm. the, the students were combined with mining engineering students. Oh yeah. So that I got instruction in mining engineering uh, too, and then uh, blacksmithing and uh, making uh, drills, you know, things that a mining engineer needs to know. And the fire essay was pretty interesting too. Determine the amount of gold and silver in the ore. Oh, yes. Fire assay method and blowpipe analysis. Uh, I have had four years of high school mathematics in the three and a half years that I was in Washington High School because I was much interested in mathematics. And uh, I exhausted Oregon State in my freshman year, so far as mathematics goes. So time went by without my getting additional training in mathematics. Four years, in fact. At the end of my sophomore year, I was working during the summer, which I had done the, no, this was the first year that I had done this. I was working as a paving plant inspector. And uh, the, uh, in southern Oregon. And when September came, I, uh, my mother told me that uh, we just didn't have enough money for me to return to college. She needed to, to continue to get some support from me. So I didn't return to college. Now, after a month, I was offered a job as an assistant instructor full time. Uh, in quantitative analysis, teaching the sophomore courses. Oh, yeah. And I had a very heavy load uh, during that year, uh, during which I taught uh, quantitative analysis to a rather advanced course to the sophomores in mining engineering and chemical engineering, and a more elementary course to a large number of students in agriculture. Yes, of I course. liked uh, quantitative analysis yes, very of course. much, and precise, the precision of it appealed to me. Yes, well I was a college professor at, at one time very early, and I always uh, felt that uh, the disciplines you get in quantitative analysis are very essential uh, to a real understanding yes. of, the, of chemistry. And, so, uh, and, and also I found that the, Teaching it helps an awful lot to really understand that. Then, a very interesting event occurred during this year that I was teaching when I was 19 years old, 18 and 19 that year. I uh, had a desk in the chemistry library. No one else came into the chemistry library. But the uh, journals arrived, and I read, I had a little spare time, despite yeah. my heavy teaching load, and I read the journals. And here, uh, the Journal of the American Chemical Society came uh, with a couple of articles in successive months, I think, by Irving Langmuir on the electron, the shared electron pair Oh, yeah. Theory of the chemical bond. You see, what year was that? 1919. Yes. When Langmuir published Yes, his that's paper. his first work. In, and in 1916, field. he referred back to G.N. Lewis. So I got out the 1916 copy of the journal with G.N. Lewis's paper in it. Oh, yes. And I gave a seminar on chemical bond theory in the shared electron pair. I think it was the only seminar that was given that year. The chemistry seminar wasn't a very common thing for a chemistry seminar to be given. Uh, so uh, I continued to be interested in chemical bonds ever since 1919, uh, the year, yes, 1919. And uh, of course, a couple of years later, when I was a senior, I applied for a teaching fellowship to Berkeley. Oh, yeah. And uh, some folder, posters had come from the, from Troop College of Technology, and the California Institute of Technology is just changing its name. I had had uh, known a couple of young fellows who had 
flunked out of Troop and then moved to Corvallis. And so I knew about Troop College of Technology. I knew it was down there in Pasadena. And uh, the head of the chemistry department had said, perhaps that would be a good place for me to go. So I applied there. And at Harvard and the Illinois, perhaps one or two other universities. So I received an offer of an appointment from Harvard of a half-time instructorship that would require six years for the PhD. Well, that didn't appeal to me very much. And moreover, uh, I was timid about going so far away from home, uh, just the expense of travel was uh, significant. And uh, I received an offer from AAOS in Pasadena. Oh, yes. Uh, with a request that I decide immediately. Well, uh, this was not really proper. In a few years, the universities got together and yes. agreed that they wouldn't put in, that there would be a, a deadline, the same for all the universities. And I hadn't heard from Berkeley. So uh, I thought, well, I. I'd better take the job that's been offered to me, and I wrote accepting the job at CIT and wrote to Berkeley and Illinois. Uh, and I'd written to Harvard, turning down that, but I wrote to Berkeley, withdrawing my application. Last June, January, January of 1983, I gave the Hitchcock lectures in Berkeley. Oh, at yes. Our general Universe, I was Hitchcock professor. So, uh, three younger members of the chemistry department spoke to me on that occasion, saying the same thing. I'd been around Berkeley from time to time, every year almost from 1922 on. I stopped oh, yeah. there for a few hours on the way to Pasadena in 1922. And uh, I was visiting lecturer in chemistry and physics for five years, coming up every spring, the same time Oppenheimer was coming down to Pasadena every spring. Uh, so yeah. that interchange. No one had told me this story until uh, 50 years, 60 years later, just a little over 60 years later. In the spring of 1922, the story is, G.M. Lewis was looking at the applications from applicants for teaching fellowships, a pile of 20 or 30, there weren't so many then, of course. And the, the, the story is he came to one and looked at and said, Linus Ploy, Oregon Agricultural College. I've never heard of that place. <laughs> Down at the, the, the oh, that, that, is, that is an absolutely <laughs> wonderful story. And then to come back uh, as the very distinguished uh, Hitchcock lecturer, uh, as I, if I'm not mistaken, I uh, remember uh, hearing the Hitchcock lectures uh, back in the 30s. Oh, they yes. had the most distinguished man. I think Devi yeah. was the one yes. who impressed me so yes. much. Uh, but uh, you never would think of missing uh, one of those no. Hitchcock lectures. Well, of course, I was back in Berkeley seven years later because in 1929 I received this offer um, to come up to Berkeley every spring as visiting professor or visiting lecturer in chemistry and physics. So it only took seven years for me to have reached that stage. In fact, in 1926, I believe it was, 25 perhaps, 26, uh, G.M. Lewis came to Pasadena, the only time he had come a few years earlier. I have a photograph that someone had taken in the early, in my, <coughs> in, well, 1918 perhaps, but he, this was the only time I think that he ever came to the Institute after that first trip in 1918. I learned only a few years ago that he had come down to offer me a job as a system professor, and the, the A.A. Noyes wouldn't let him. Oh, <laughs> that, that, <laughs> that's, that's uh, He had been with oh, yeah. Arthur Amos Noyes at MIT. Yeah. He, uh, 
Van Weiss had set up the research laboratory of physical chemistry, uh, Lewis, after he got his PhD with Richards at Harvard, Lewis came over to uh, the research laboratory as the assistant director. He was with Noyes, and Noyes may well have been involved in Lewis's becoming dean of the College of Chemistry at Berkeley uh, back in around 1911, I think. Yeah. So that's uh, a very interesting Noyes, bit of history. And Noyes, of course, ran uh, much of chemistry in the United States, just oh. as George Ellery Hale ran much of science yes. in the United States. Noyes and Hale were very close together in running things in the period around 1920, 1915 to 1920. National Research Council <coughs> getting the academy building Noyes. Yes. Hale. Hale was primarily responsible for oh, that yes. with Noyes backing them up. Well, that uh, that is a uh, Fascinating story, weaving together all of these uh, men, and how uh, you uh, uh, you pointed out that uh, uh, reading about uh, G. N. Lewis's work and Langmuir's work, and how you took that and, and yes. then extended that uh, uh, yes. to the uh, to all of your uh, theoretical work. Uh, that's it. I've been very fortunate, you know. Uh, in during my life, in that several times something has happened that, uh, in retrospect, I see uh, turned out to have been just the right thing to have happened. And for me to have gone to Pasadena in 1922 was really uh, most fortunate. That was great. I have said that I don't believe I could have got better training for the work that I have carried out anywhere else, anywhere in the world than I got uh, there in Pasadena. Here, I came up seven years later, or four years after my PhD, uh, as visiting yeah. Professor Berkeley, because they needed to be brought up to date. That's yeah. why they got me to come Yes. Up. Well, of course, that re reminds me of the, the famous saying, however, that uh, of Pasteur, who says, fortune favors a prepared mind. And so you had to be prepared uh, for all of yes, this. Yes, that's right. But uh, there were remarkable <laughs> teachers there. And of course, it was a small place, the total of perhaps 300 undergraduates and uh, about 30 or 40 graduate students and 50 faculty members back in 1922. The man with whom I did my doctoral work, Roscoe Jokey Dickinson, was the first person to get a PhD from the California Institute of Technology. He got it in 1920. And, uh, there were a couple every year then, up until 1925, when I got mine. There were quite a number, perhaps a dozen, perhaps not that many, ten in physics and chemistry together in 1925. But the teachers were marvelous, and of course the classes were small. Uh, Tolman, Richard Chase Tolman, uh, was uh, one of these outstanding uh, teachers there at CIT. Uh, I studied the oh, uh, course that he gave uh, on the nature of science, essentially. Very interesting course. Uh, I think he may have given it only once, only this year, 1922-23. And then uh, statistical mechanics I studied with Tolman. Uh, uh, very thoroughly. Uh, after taking the course one year, I attended the, the next year and the next year, and a number of years later, uh, when he was presenting the course, uh, I uh, went in to, I thought I'd audit the course again, but uh, as soon as I came in, he beckoned to me and said, Stay out. So, <laughs> so I stayed out. You know, yes. He thought, uh, I think that uh, my presence would handicap him in presenting the subject to the 
when you're a student, you didn't know anything about it. So I learned a great deal from Tolman. One of my first papers, well, my first papers were published in 1923 uh, on crystal structure. And, uh, by 1925, I was publishing papers on quantum theory, the old quantum theory. Tolman and I published a paper in 1925 on the entropy of supercooled liquids, crystals and supercooled liquids. This was an application of statistical mechanics to the problem of liquid structure yeah. losses. Uh, dur uh, during that particular uh, uh, period of time, this was uh, leading up, I was just uh, trying to think when your your cl classical book, uh, The Nature of the Chemical Bond, uh, uh, came out. And I, I'd forgotten, uh, I, yes. I think I've seen the book almost uh, as long as I can remember, but yes. I can't quite remember what the... What well, the, it was published in uh, 1939. Oh, yeah. I, uh, it was my third book. Mm -hmm. The first book that I wrote was uh, The Structure of Line Spectrum. Oh, yeah. And uh, that I wrote in collaboration mm -hmm. with Goudsmith. Oh, yes. Goudsmith uh, was in Denmark when I was there in 1927. And he and I worked together for a month uh, tackling the problem of the theory of hyperfine structure of spectral lines. And I translated his thesis from Dutch to English and uh, used that as chapters four, five, and six of the book. I wrote uh, three chapters in sort of introduction to quantum theory and quantum mechanics. And then three chapters on the vector model of the atom that Goldsmith had been largely involved in developing with the spinning electron, of course, which he and Ewan Beck had discovered. And then uh, four chapters more uh, that I wrote uh, partially with material that Doug Smith had sent to me from uh, Ann Arbor, where he had in the meantime become a member of the physics department. That came out in 1930. Then in 1935, one of my first uh, graduate students in, in theoretical chemistry, Wright Wilson, oh, yeah. who later went to, um, to Harvard. Wright, I wrote together with Wright Wilson the book Introduction to Quantum Mechanics. That came out in 1935, and for 48 years it continued to be sold by McGraw-Hill without any changes. It never was revised. Oh, and that's, but uh, only last year, or early this year, did they decide that they weren't selling enough copies to keep it in print. That's so amazing. So it didn't quite make 50 years. Of, yeah. for, for 10 years or more, it had been the oldest unrevised book that McGraw-Hill yeah. kept in print. So then my third book was The Nature of the Chemical Bond. Yes. Well, I, my graduate work, my experimental work uh, at CIT was on the determination of the structure of crystals by the X-ray diffraction method. Uh, CIT uh, was the first place in the United States where crystal structure determination was made by X-ray diffraction. Burdick and Ellis, who had come with A. A. Moyes to Pasadena, uh, carried out yeah. that study, and then Dickinson took it on. Uh, his doctoral thesis was on X ray diffraction, and uh, he was in charge of the X ray laboratory. This was, of course, just fine for me with my interest in the chemical plot. <sighs> in 1925, I had uh, a, a freshman student in 1924 to 25. I was in charge of uh, a dozen freshmen who had been selected from a total of uh, 125, I think, that they admitted, 
as being probably the more able ones, the honor section. And uh, during half of the year of Dr. Moy's suggestion, uh, these students uh, carried on small researches, independent researches in their freshman year. Well, not quite independent. Noyes suggested some problems that they might attack, and I suggested some. And only one of these investigations led to a publication, uh, which was, of course, the first paper by the student that was on the structure of the alloys of lead and thallium in the X-ray investigation. And the student was the son of uh, my wife's physician, or our family physician, in Pasadena. He worked through the summer after the freshman year came to an end. He continued to come to the laboratory to finish this investigation, which was published in the Journal of the American Chemical Society. Now that was quite, that was the triumph for a young man yes. to be associated with His name was Edward McMillan. Oh, uh, no. Yeah. No, that so, is a fantastic story. A little later, he got his bachelor's degree and went to Berkeley yes. to study and got his PhD degree. Yes. And of course, he invented the synchrotron well, simultaneously yes. with uh, Bexler in the yes. Soviet Union and uh, became Lawrence's successor, I think. Yes, he was, uh, he was director of uh, the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratories for many years. I yes. It must have been at least 10 years, I believe. Yeah. I remember when I came up to Berkeley to give my lectures, uh, I think it may have been, not have been, but the spring of 29, possibly 30, uh, either the first or the second time that I came, uh, Ernest Lawrence had arrived. Oh, yes. So mm -hmm. I became well acquainted with Ernest Lawrence. And then in 1931, 30 or 31, 31, I think, I was uh, for a month visiting lecturer at MIT, giving oh, a set yeah. of lectures there, and I was asked to be the chairman of the chemistry department. To, Slater had become the chairman of the physics department, but I preferred to stay at California yeah. Institute of Technology. And uh, Ernest decided to get married, Ernest. So I was an usher when he and Molly Lawrence were married in uh, New Haven. And that is an amazing thing. As, uh, just as a matter of coincidence, uh, uh, Ernest Lawrence was uh, was at our uh, wedding. Uh, well, too, and, and Larry with, uh, is named after him. Uh, well. his, his name is Ernest Lawrence Larson. Well, well that's uh, Larry is Lawrence. So, uh, Lawrence. so it, uh, that's really fine. there is a. There, it's strange how all of these names that come together, particularly that story of Ed McMillan, is a fabulous one. I think. I just put in a box of clippings here a couple of pages about Molly from the Berkeley paper that oh. you may not have seen. No. And I, I think it might be worthwhile for you to talk oh. with Molly because of Ernest's importance. Oh. Yeah. That yeah. is she has something to say, too. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I'm very happy to get that. We get uh, a Christmas card from uh, Molly every year, yes. and we exchange Christmas cards. And I think that uh, uh, definitely, with your suggestion there, I I'll do that because I had expected to get something from Ed McMillan and something from Glenn Seaborg yeah. about uh, Ernest. Uh, yes. You know, so, yes. Uh, yeah. so. Well, of course, Molly was in close contact with yes. <laughs> She Fine. makes some statements in this Good. interview uh, that uh, rather surprised me. One of them was that Ernest felt strongly that there should be no more wars after the Second yeah. World War. And uh, I knew, you know, he was a very patriotic man, yeah, and yes. you know what his oh, oh, yes. was like, working hard. And, uh, so, uh, the, uh, well, that, uh, this that feeling that he had that she expresses in Good. Well, I, we, we must, uh, tomorrow when we're over in Berkeley, let's give Molly a ring. You know that she has been trying to get 
Ernest's name removed from the Liverpool Laboratory. Oh, I did not. You didn't know that. And uh, the university turned her request down, so she has uh, got a member of the California legislature to introduce a bill to this thing, or at least is trying. Yes, well, these are interesting things, and I'm, I'm delighted that uh, you, you're giving me this information before I get over to Berkeley tomorrow. That's right. And her argument is that Ernest felt so strongly that the existence of nuclear weapons required that we yeah. give up the war yeah. between yes. the great nations that uh, yeah. he himself would not yeah. have liked yeah. to see his name that, attached that, to that, the that, uh, nuclear weapons. Because, weapon. uh, well, his name is, is associated so much with the uh, application of uh, radioisotopes and, and nuclear yes. Yes. electric power and everything else that uh, he naturally would want to be remembered for that. Yes. yes. Well, well, that's wonderful. Now, uh, uh, the uh, uh, in this, uh, I was just going to ask you another question about uh, uh, the uh, uh, your book on uh, chemical binding and your start of work on your X-ray uh, uh, X-ray studies of yes. the crystal yes. structure, which. Uh, of course, again, has led to a revolutionary uh, uh, yes. thought in, in both uh, physics, chemistry, and biology in yes. the last century. Yes. Uh, well, the, uh, I was fortunate to go to Pasadena. I took uh, courses in advanced mathematics from people such as Bateman and uh, uh, Charles Galton Darwin, Darwin, the original Charles Darwin. Uh, who was a visiting lecturer there and spoke, gave lectures on uh, Lagrangian and Hamiltonian mechanics. Mm -hmm. and I, and, uh, but Bateman was a great mathematician. And, uh, I enjoyed his courses very much, although sometimes they got, uh, the mathematics got beyond me. My main interest was chemistry. Uh, I got my PhD in, with a major in chemistry in 1925, and I had signed up for a minor in physics, but when I got the diploma, I saw they had given me a minors in physics and mathematics. Oh, yeah. So in 1925, as I was approaching the PhD, I applied for a National Research Council fellowship, which was the thing to do. It was required that one move from the university where one got a PhD. So I put down Berkeley. Here again was my interest in Berkeley. They had no X ray apparatus in Berkeley. I think GM Lewis had uh, written me that they would get some X ray apparatus when I came. Noise said to me, uh, in the summertime, when I was after my degree, said to me, here you have so many experimental results, structure determinations, that you haven't written up for publication yet. And I think it would be wise if you were to postpone going to Berkeley in order to write those papers. So I said, all right. Then he said that there's some Guggenheim Fellowship has come out, and uh, the head of the Guggenheim Committee of Selection, Frank Adelot, is coming here next week. The committee is selecting a few people to get Guggenheim Fellowships this year, even though uh, there hasn't been any announcement of applications. Nobody has applied for one yet, uh, but they are planning to give a few fellowships. So you should meet Dr. Adolf. And so we had dinner, lunch, and Dr. Noyce, Dr. Adolf, Millican, and I. Then Dr. Noyce said that they had decided that uh, they wouldn't give me a Guggenheim fellowship, 
when I hadn't applied for one, and this year when we were just starting, but that I had applied for one for the first formal, yeah, the first year in which applications were made. So I wrote, uh, see, you know, I just did what I was told. I was a good conformist, <laughs> yeah. conforming person. I didn't, uh, you didn't rebel. I didn't yeah. rebel or didn't really think very much for myself. I had got married after my first year as a graduate student, and this was one of the events in my life that was most fortunate to, that, to, that I got married to the right person who was smart enough to pick me out. <laughs> so we were married for 58 and a half years. I went back for a year for my for my first year as a graduate student. I was in Pasadena by myself. And then at the end of that year we were married. So my wife was with me and of course protected me the rest of my life, enabled me to devote myself uh, effectively to my scientific interests and ultimately of course I think influenced me to get me to do something more than just the scientific interest. That's a too. marvelous tribute. So then, uh, I applied for the Guggenheim Fellowship and uh, the, I'd been in Pasadena about four months and uh, should go to Berkeley, you see. And Dr. Noyce said, uh, it's hardly worthwhile for you to change from one laboratory to another for just a few months. The Guggenheim Fellowship would be given in April for next year, or May it would be announced, and uh, it would be better if you just stayed in Pasadena. So I said, all right. That was all right for me. I didn't have to move. Yeah. And so then he said to me, <laughs> he said to me, uh, the, uh, well, the Guggenheim Fellowship, I mean, the National Research Council Fellowship requires that you leave so that uh, you can't stay on in Pasadena. So why don't you resign? from it and go directly to Europe and the Institute will give you some advance you some money uh, to take care of your expenses until the Guggenheim Fellowship comes through. So I said, well, that sounds like a good idea. <laughs> yeah. uh, we'll go to Europe in 1928, in uh, 1926, uh, leaving in February. And I wrote to the National Research Council, resigning my fellowship, and I got a very caustic letter, <laughs> yeah. a very critical letter, uh, saying here they had wasted one of these fellowships on a person who was only using half of it, and this was quite improper. Huh? Well, of course, Noyes had said that. He'd been involved, he said again, the National Research Council fellowship. I, <laughs> yes. I, I, just did what he said, and he was keeping me from going to Berkeley. Oh, yeah. And other people knew this. I didn't know it, but other people knew it. But he was just keeping me from getting to Berkeley. So I went to, my wife and I went to Europe in February, March. We got there. I think we left the about the 1st of March and got there about the end of March it took time. Well, we have the, the month, uh, the month of April in, uh, in uh, Italy. Dr. Noyes had planned out just where we should go and had given us a baby curve with everything. One week in Naples and going down to Pesto, Paestum and going through Vesuvius and all of these things, and then one week in Rome, and one week in Florence, and one week in Venice, going over to Pisa and Florence. And so. so we arrived in Munich, and I began working with 
summer felt. And this was really fortunate, too. How long uh, uh, did you stay with summer? Well, I stayed a year mm -hmm. then, and then spent uh, seven months uh, traveling, going to for Ohio to Bohr, Bohr's Institute, mm -hmm. and then to Zurich with Schrodinger and the Bay. And uh, then I went back in 1930 for six months to Europe, and then didn't get back until 1947 and then to Europe again. So uh, the Big Nine Fellowship didn't come through all right. Yeah. So uh, with the Guggenheim application, one was supposed to enclose a statement that the institution that you were going to would accept you. I had written to Sommerfeld, whom I had met when he visited Pasadena, and to Bohr, whom I had also seen when he visited Pasadena. My memory is that I wrote on some yellow lined paper just by hand yeah. to each of these persons. I never got an answer from Bohr. But the summer felt answered and said, yes, it would be all right. And accordingly, I went to Munich. Well, I learned much more by going to Munich than I would have learned by going to Copenhagen. Sommerfeld was a marvelous teacher. His students mm -hmm. are outstanding, of course. Dubai, uh, yeah. and Heisenberg, and Powley. They, Heisenberg and Powley took their doctorates with him. I think Dubai was the doctor of Sommerfeld. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you can count off uh, yes. many of the younger theoretical physicists. Yes, those, Beta, uh, took, Beta was there as a student when I was... Oh, is that right? When I went back in 1930, he was assistant or pre I don't remember which. And uh, various other well-known physicists were there. But the main thing was that Sommerfeld was lecturing on wave mechanics. Here, I arrived in Europe just the same month, I think, when Schrodinger's first paper came out. And his other papers kept coming out during the year, the first part of the year that I was there. And Sommerfeld was lecturing on this subject. It was really marvelous. That, that's amazing how the, all of those giants were together in such a short period of time. Yes, and uh, that I, I should have had the good fortune, not the good sense, but the good fortune to have gone to Munich to Sommerfeld instead of to Copenhagen to Bora. When I went to Copenhagen, uh, I spent my time there uh, helping a couple of uh, Japanese physicists who were working on a problem involving crystals, and I was able to assist them in that work. But most of my time uh, was spent uh, working on a hyperfine structure problem with the Cotsmith, who thought that I was a more theoretical man, more uh, better versed in mathematical physics than he was. And I saw Bohr only a couple of times during the whole time I was there. So uh, there weren't lectures being given that uh, were at all comparable to what was presented in uh, Munich. And of course, it was much better for me to have learned the German uh, than to have learned Danish, too. Yes, it would have been much easier for you all the way yeah. around. Yes. So, uh, this was a great time in Munich. The first thing that happened, I had applied uh, in my application. I said I wanted to understand the electronic structure of atoms well enough to be able to apply this knowledge to chemical problems, the structure of molecules and crystals. And I began work. Sommerfeld had suggested a problem to me, which I worked on for a little while, which was the value of the anomalous g factor of the electron. Abraham, the theoretical physicist Abraham, had uh, published a paper around 1900 about the magnetic moment of a spinning electron. 
system, which he showed that with different distributions of electricity, uh, uniformly or surface charge, you get different values of the G factor. And Zumperfeld thought there might be something to that. I didn't get anywhere with that problem. He, uh, I had a problem that I was interested in, the motion of the diatomic molecule hydrogen chloride mm -hmm. in crossed electric and magnetic fields. Oh, yes. And I worked on that and published a paper about it in the physical review. But something then happened that really was fortunate. I was reading the Zeitschrift für Physik, and I came across a paper by Gregor Wenzel, I'm a Schwierigkeit für die Theorie des Kreiselelektrons. He had invent, he was prefactocent for Zammerfeld at the time. He was in the laboratory there. He had invented a way of treating atoms with many electrons. A sort of perturbation method, not exactly, but he carried out an expansion in inverse powers of the uh, reverse negative powers of the atomic number and the neglected all terms beyond the square, the inverse square. He evaluated the screening constants for the uh, screening doublets that Zummerfeld had uh, discovered in the course of his developing the zummerfeld wilson quantum conditions in the old quantum theory. And the values that he got didn't agree with the experiment. That was the difficulty. So uh, I read this paper with great interest because of my interest in my wanting to uh, do something about the complicated atoms, the atoms with many electrons. And I thought, it, even though he hasn't got a good result, uh, I ought to, I might be able to apply this method. I uh, I didn't just read the paper. When I came to an equation, I then uh, developed the next equation myself. And pretty soon my equations were different from Wenzel's equations. Uh, remarkable. And I found that uh, at one point when he was carrying out his in inverse powers of the atomic number, uh, he just uh, had decided that there was some quantity of a quantum number that he didn't need to, well, that would be the same quantum number. And this was perhaps a rather sensible assumption to have made, but it was the wrong assumption. That is, it wasn't just an error, it was, a, it was drawing their wrong conclusion. Uh, I expanded this, and my uh, theoretical values of the screening constants agreed with Zummerfeld's empirical ones. Oh, yeah. So I took this paper to Professor Zummerfeld, you see, and uh, he said, uh, we'd better show it to Wenzel, and Wenzel didn't have anything to say except that it was right. <laughs> yeah. and so it was published in uh, the Encyclopedia mm -hmm. for Physique on the American Liberty Theory against yeah. Chrysalomic or something like that. And then I went ahead using this technique uh, to determine ionic radii and to determine the X ray uh, F values, scattering powers, and uh, diamagnetic. Uh, susceptibilities of ion atoms and ions and the electric polarizabilities of atoms and ions all through the periodic table. Uh, so far, a year or two, uh, I was able to exploit this treatment uh, of quantum mechanical treatment of complicated systems very effectively. So that uh, you were re really able to uh, uh, to translate some of these uh, uh, essentially quantum physics into quantum chemistry there, That's right. uh, uh, which has proved so tremendously yes. useful. That's right. So I wrote then papers on the 
the principles determining the structure of complex silicates and other complex crystals and the, uh, on the theory of the chemical bond, Gobel bond in 1927. In that paper, I said, because of the resonance phenomenon, the four bonds formed by the carbon atom turn out to be equivalent, not different as mm -hmm. is suggested by the S and P orbitals, mm -hmm. but equivalent to one another in quite in different equal directions. I didn't publish, I published a note about that, two or three page paper on that and some other results in 1928, I guess. 1931, it wasn't until 1931 that I published a detailed discussion because my first treatment was so complicated that I felt that nobody, that I couldn't convince anybody else. And I found a way of simplifying it in 1931, December 1930, I think, that then came out as my first long paper on quantum mechanics of the chemical bond. Someone pointed out to me the other day that times have changed. He had seen that 1931 paper by me where it said uh, received February 10th, 1931, published March 27, 1931. And I think that by this time I had made such an impression on the editor of the Journal of the American Chemical Society that when this paper came in, uh, he just sent it off to the printer without sending it out to reveries. That's my explanation. Yes, well, uh, that's uh, that's an uh, amazing story, particularly the length of time now that it takes to get uh, articles published. And, and that's what's so nice of, though, about uh, uh, science occasionally. You can get things into science uh, much faster than you yes. can into the regular journals, which is a very important important yeah. contribution. And sometimes it takes longer. Uh, I wrote uh, a paper on uh, carbon-14 radioactive uh, carbon-14 produced by bomb tests and mm -hmm. sent it to science oh, yes. and uh, I got back with comments by a referee. So I revised it and sent it mm -hmm. again and got it back again mm -hmm. comments by a referee. And I revised it and sent it back again and got it back some got it back again. And what the referee said that this estimate of six hundred megatons of uh, nuclear explosions mm -hmm. in the atmosphere is an astronomical exaggeration. Well, uh, all of the calculations that I had made were based on guesses that I made because uh, the information to us wasn't released. But I would read the paper, there was a paper by Libby on carbon-14 in which there were a few numbers, and yes. then I calculated back um, the, trying to estimate quantities, I don't know them, yes. I ended up with this number 600. Then, um, I said I refused to make any further changes in this paper, and Abelson then printed it a year after I had sent it in. But it finally was published. And of course, years later, the information came out and yes. my estimates were just right. Yes. In fact, uh, uh, I, 1947, no, probably 52, I've forgotten which year, the government brought out its first statement about biological effects of fallout radioactivity. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, the, when the statement appeared, I was quite pleased. Wiesner had called me and said that he would like to know just how I had made my calculations. Oh, yes. And my wife and I were on the way to Europe. I sat down and wrote out with pen yeah. uh, just my derivation of all of the quantities. Mm -hmm. And when uh, the government's report came out, uh, they had used my calculations. But the numbers weren't the same because they had referred to the United States instead of the world as a whole. Oh, yeah. And 
uh, I have estimated that the population would continue to grow yes. and that carbon-14 yeah. would continue to affect future generations, larger numbers, and uh, they assumed the population of the United States would stay 150 million oh, yes. for the next thousand years. Yes. <laughs> uh, so the numbers look smaller, yeah. but... Uh, but at any rate, the, the mathematics uh, agreed all the way around. And that's right. Well, the assumptions that I have made, yeah. they, they accept that, yeah. too. So, in the early 1930s, here I was in the physics department. And in fact, when I was in Munich, I received a letter in the spring of 1927 from a boy saying that the institute was offering me a position as assistant professor of theoretical chemistry and mathematical physics. And I wrote back accepting. When I got to Pasadena in the fall, I found that I was assistant professor of theoretical chemistry. Now I had managed to, yeah. <laughs> to get the mathematical yeah. physics that dropped from my title. Uh, because I think he thought the, the physics department's getting along all right. <laughs> yes. But we better but that's very to interesting. build up the chemistry. So department. he wanted to make, make sure that the chemistry uh, was strengthened. And, uh, that was yes. very interesting. Yes. A little later, he asked if I wouldn't become professor of organic chemistry. He wanted to build up organic chemistry. Well, I had had one elementary course in organic chemistry in my junior year at Carballus. Yes. Uh, I didn't like it. I <laughs> didn't think much of organic chemistry. I had made big contributions to it, of course, with chemical bond theory. With your chemical bond theory. But I still didn't like it. Yes. <laughs> So uh, I refused. I said, yeah. what I'd like to be is professor of chemistry. Yeah. So he said, all right, you can be. I didn't like being professor of theoretical chemistry. And we have the rule, uh, which Morris, I think, he instituted most of the fundamental principles on which California Institute of Technology was built up. And he um, Hale managed to get Millikan to come in as a sort of front man oh, to yeah. hobnob with the rich people in the oh, yeah. Los area and raise money. While he, Norris, determined the academic principles. One of them was that women shouldn't be admitted. He was a bachelor. In oh, yes. Yeah. He thought it was just a waste of energy to train women in science. Yeah. Uh, it took that, a long time. It took a long time for the policy uh, to change. To change. The That's right. Yeah. When I left, uh, there were graduates. I left in 1964. There were some graduate women graduate students, no undergraduates yet. Yeah. Now there are a number of women undergraduate students. So Norris determined the academic policies of, of the institute. Yes, well, that was a tremendous uh, foundation that he laid there for yes. the prestige of the institution. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, that, uh, then as you, uh, uh, as you went along, uh, as you expanded your interest in, uh, in the, in the uh, structure to more complicated and more complicated uh, yes. things. And I was wondering if you could make a few remarks yes. about that. Uh, well, of course, I, I was interested in physics all during yeah. all of this period, and occasionally wrote a paper about some physical problem, uh, and interested even in nuclear physics, yeah. but uh, only starting in 1965 have I published papers on nuclear physics, nuclear structure. The, uh, I was interested in inorganic chemistry and then in organic chemistry uh, almost entirely from the structural point of view. Yes. 
the question, how are the properties of a substance determined by its structure? Mm -hmm. This could be its crystal structure, molecular yeah. structure, or electronic mm -hmm. structure of the atoms, mm -hmm. which determines the other structures. Well, of course, you're, uh, you did uh, early work uh, on, this, on the nucleic acid uh, also. Yes. And, uh, and, uh, the way that this came about, is uh, through the natural outgrowth, I think, of my interest in molecular structure. Mm -hmm. uh, first, I worked on crystals, mm -hmm. inorganic substances, simple, yes. more complicated ones. In 1930, when I was in Germany, I learned about a new technique that Hermann Mark had invented, electron diffraction by gas molecules. Mm -hmm. I asked Mark, if it was all right, if I were to build an apparatus like that, he said, all right, he wasn't going to go ahead with it. He was working for the EA Farman industry. And so this was yeah. sort of, he was working mainly on practical problems. So, and he even gave me the plans for their apparatus. So uh, I got a graduate student that worked with the shop building the apparatus. And we began determining the structures of organic compounds. And of course, during the early 1930s, we got a great deal of experimental information from a couple of hundred organic molecules. And uh, the theory was developing rapidly. I felt pretty satisfied about uh, ordinary organic compounds, just yeah. as I felt pretty satisfied yeah. about the inorganic yeah. compounds. But I thought, here is an interesting substance, hemoglobin. I knew about it. I didn't know much biology, but I knew about hemoglobin. <coughs> it had been found a few years earlier, 1927, that the molecule contains four iron atoms, about 10,000 yeah. atoms altogether, four iron atoms in the heme groups. Yeah. And uh, I thought, to, I've heard about this sigmoid equilibrium curve of oxygen. So I'll apply physical chemistry to that, and the structural chemistry. And I worked out a theory of the oxygen equilibrium curve. That was my first paper on proteins. Then I thought uh, nobody knows how the oxygen molecules stick to the hemoglobin molecule. Some people say, it's a sort of adsorption mm -hmm. you know, onto this large molecule of oxygen. It's adsorbed. Mm -hmm. And that Langmuir showed you'd get a sort of sigmoid mm -hmm. curve. Uh, and uh, other people say there's a chemical bond form. Well, oxygen has two unpaired electrons. It is paramagnetic. You can pick up liquid oxygen by a magnet. The liquid will yeah. stick hang between the poles of the magnet. I knew that. I knew that G.M. Lewis had, back in the early 1920s, interpreted measurements of the magnetic susceptibility of solutions of oxygen, liquid oxygen, and liquid nitrogen to show that there is an equilibrium between the paramagnetic oxygens and diamagnetic O4. He had determined the equilibrium constant to the Free energy, standard free energy, and the standard uh, enthalpy of the reaction, the combination. Very clever of G.M. Lewis to done that. He discovered O4, the dimer of O2. So I thought, uh, uh, why don't we measure the magnetic susceptibility of oxyhemoglobin? It'll be paramagnetic if the oxygen molecules at least there will be a paramagnetic component. And I uh, wrote, I have been getting some support from the Rockefeller Foundation uh, for two or three years already. I have applied to them for some money to work, permit me to work on the structure of the sulfide minerals. And they gave me $5,000, and the next year $10,000, and the next year $15,000 perhaps. So I said, I want to study the magnetic properties of oxyhemoglobin, and uh, they sent me $50,000. A 
we have also a little suggestion that they weren't very interested in the sulfide minerals, but were interested in biology. Oh, yeah. So uh, I have a student, Charles Coriel, working on him. You remember? Yes, yeah, I know Charles Coriel very well. He was, uh, he, was at, he was at Oak Ridge. Yes, for, he had taken his PhD long, 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 long. and come to me as a postdoctoral fellow. Mm -hmm. And he and I uh, set up an apparatus yes. and got some blood and measured oxyhemoglobin was completely diamagnetic, which showed that you had chemical combination. But the hemoglobin without oxygen was strongly paramagnetic, and I hadn't predicted that. This was, this was the, one of the rare occasions when something has come along uh, because of an experiment that I carried out that uh, was a surprise to me. And, but uh, the change in magnetic properties of the iron atom gave, uh, permitted us to get great insight into uh, the arrangement of other atoms around the iron atoms in the hemoglobin molecule. Moreover, this technique of measuring magnetic susceptibility permitted us to determine equilibrium constants and rates of reaction. So over the next few years, my students and I published 15 or 20 papers on hemoglobin and hemoglobin derivatives. TRL came over from Sweden uh, about 1939 and worked for a month to learn the technique and divide them to the heme compounds, the iron proteins that he was working with in, in the Sweden, yeah. and uh, in general, that worked out very well. Yeah, that's carried a long so, way from your your very simple atom. So uh, then I thought, the thought about the rest of the hemoglobin molecule, the protein, mm -hmm. and here Asbury in England was. Taking X-ray detection photographs of hair barn, fingernail, mm -hmm. and other people too, uh, starting in Japan and Germany, had uh, made photographs of, of silk and wool, you know, hairs, wool, mm -hmm. other people had updated the best very. I uh, took some of these x-ray photographs in 1937 and then tried to find the structure, a way of coiling the polypeptide chain. Mm -hmm. Other people were trying to. No success. I thought, uh, I think I knew a lot about these atoms and how they combine with one another, but the structures that I've been predicting don't seem to be the right ones, so there must be something that I don't know about proteins. Nobody has ever determined the structure of an amino acid or of a dipeptide, a simple peptide. So why don't we go ahead and do that? And the Rockefeller Foundation mm -hmm. gave us money. Mm -hmm. and Co uh, Robert Corey had come just that summer at 37 to work with me, and I talked with him about this problem, which mm -hmm. interested him. We decided to go ahead and for 10 years in our institute to, with a good number of different people mm -hmm. involved in it, to, we determined these structures or about 10 amino acids and several simple peptides. And nobody else in the whole world had turned out a single correct structure for any of these fundamental yeah. substances during this whole period. What the simple polypeptide did you use first? Well, I mean, the uh, first the dipeptide. One, the first one was dichemopiperazine, oh, yes. which is a cyclic yeah. uh, diglycyl, mm -hmm. cyclic diglycyl. The second structure, I think, was glycyl, glycine, and then mm -hmm. glycyl alanine, oh, yes. and, and so on, and the tripeptide or two. Mm -hmm. So, uh, ten years later, when I was Eastman professor in Oxford, I uh, thought, uh, I'd better think about that problem again. I failed in 1937. Here it is, 1948, 11 years later. There was nothing surprising about the amino acids or the simple peptides. They all have 
just the structures that I had assigned to them back in 1937. But I thought, I'll try again, and I'll forget about the X-ray diffraction photographs. First, I won't have them here. But they weren't very good anyway, these fiber diagrams. Second, uh, I'll just forget about them. Suppose I assume that uh, the residues are equivalent to one another. Back in 1928, I had written a paper about structural principles in, in uh, uh, the silicates and such substances. And one of the principles was the principle of parsimony, that the, the units are to be kept as, the different kinds of units are to be as few as possible in number. So I'll assume all the amino acid residues in the polypeptide chain are equivalent. In a course that I had from Bateman back about 1925 or 4, he had shown that the most general symmetry operation that converts an asymmetric object into an identical object is rotation around some line in space coupled with rotate the translation along it. And if you repeat this operation, you get a helix. Oh, yes. So I said, the, here I haven't looked at any helical structures. I know other people have. I'm not sure that I knew that then, but other people had uh, looked at helical structures for the polypeptide chains and hadn't found them. I'll look at them. I took a sheet of paper and made a sketch on it and then folded the paper to get the bond angle of alpha carbon correct until kept folding it with parallel until it came around again and I tried to form a hydrogen bond from this turn to the next turn and couldn't do it. So I tried again putting the folds in a different way and finally got this hydrogen bond. And that was yeah. the alpha helix. And, and that's the alpha, that's that the alpha helix, helix. That, that helix. When you got that. Uh, so uh, I predicted the properties of this alpha helix on the x ray diagram. And the x ray diagram would show a repeat in uh, 7.4 angstroms. Actually, the x ray, that was the pitch of yeah. this helix, 7.4 mm -hmm. angstroms. The x-ray diagram showed 7.1 angstroms, and there you have about a 5% error, and the, I couldn't see how that was possible. I waited a year, more than a year, before publishing anything about it. And at the end of the year, uh, 1949, a paper was published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society by Bragg, uh, Kendrew, and Perutz on the structure of the polypeptide chain in alpha oh, yeah. keratin. And they described about 20 structures, all of which were wrong. Oh. <laughs> the, yeah. So I said, Corey, we'd better publish. Yeah. about the alpha helix and the gamma helix, so we set off a short note to be printed and started writing a longer paper. But then, a little later, a paper was published by some investigators at Cortos on a synthetic polypeptide that they had uh, been interested in for artificial fibers, yeah. a polygamma methyl L-glutamate. Uh, they had spun fibers of this synthetic polypeptide and made x-ray photographs of them. And they were something like the photographs you get from hair, uh, but different in a very interesting way. The main reflection that gave the 7.4 angstrom repeat, or pseudo-repeat, didn't appear. There were two reflections off to the side, not meridional reflections two strong reflections like this. And they corresponded to 5.1, not 5.1, I said 7.4, yeah. I meant 5.1. Yeah. They corresponded to a 5.1 angstrom oh. pseudo-repeat rather oh. than 5.4.
And on the hair, these reflections have formed, coalesced to form an arc. And by measuring this arc up like this, you see, I, there was a 5% error, which had fooled everybody. Oh, yes. So uh, that showed, uh, this showed that the alpha helix was right. Yeah. In the meantime, uh, there was this paper by Bragg, Kendrew, and Perutz with all of their structures wrong and ours right. And why? Well, you, when the peptide groups uh, attach to one another, they form what's called the peptide bond, NHCO. Yes, yes that's right, the, the standard peptide bond. And even back in the early 1930s, I had said that uh, there's some double bond character here to this CN part because of the theory of resonance that I've been writing about. And this double bond character requires that those six atoms lie in one plane. So you have to keep those six atoms coplanar. And uh, then you have another group of these six, and you can rotate around the single bonds to the alpha carbons. It makes a very simple, rather simple problem, just two parameters with my assumption of equivalence. But of course, the Bragg's, Bragg and these others uh, had a third parameter, rotation around this, which made it a very difficult uh, uh, problem. And uh, none of the 20 structures that Bragg, Kendrew, and Perutz described contained these planar peptide groups. So, so, so they were in error. In so they were in error. Yeah. Um, and, Todd, Lord Todd, uh, the head of the chemistry department at uh, Cambridge, who's a friend of mine, when I was chairman of the chemistry, division of chemistry and chemical engineering, when I became chairman in 1937, I applied to the uh, Rockefeller Foundation for some money to build up organic chemistry. As Noyce had said seven years earlier, oh, yeah. five years earlier, we ought to be doing something about organic chemistry. And they gave us a million dollars on a matching grant, so we were able to make some appointments. And I traveled around the United States talking to various organic chemists and offered the job to Todd, who came for one term with his wife. And, uh, then we offered him a permanent professorship to be head of organic chemistry. On the way back to, he was Bite Fellow, had been in England. On the way back to England, while he was on the ship, the British got busy and arranged for him to be offered the professorship at uh, Manchester. Yes. And then he went to Cambridge. So he told me, uh, after this Alpha Helix affair, that uh, when Bragg read our paper in 1949, he rushed over to the chemistry department at Cambridge and said, Here, I came over last year to talk to you about the structure of polypeptide chains, and you didn't tell me that that uh, group is planar. And Tom said, well, I'm pretty sure I did. I can remember quite clearly saying <laughs> to you that I had always thought that that carbon-nitrogen bond had some double bond character. Well, of course, uh, I'm sure that's what happened. Uh, Todd said to Bragg, I'm sure that that bond has some double bond character, but Bragg didn't know enough chemistry to know that that meant that the six atoms would lie in the same plane. Yes, well, that's an amazing... Uh uh, Bragg, with his, of course, uh, distinguished uh, record in this field, uh, the, I suppose uh, yes. uh, there could be some misunderstandings and communications there. So uh, we found that the gamma helix doesn't seems not to occur in nature. It has a hole down the middle that you can't fill up with anything. It's not big enough to be filled up, but it. Uh, it decreases the Van der Waals interactions of stabilizing a structure by structures in general don't have holes in them, condensed phases. And it doesn't occur 
But the parallel chain, the anti-parallel chain depleted sheets, which we also predicted, also occurred, and globular proteins, there have been several hundred of them studied now, uh, all contain these units, the alpha helix, the parallel chain pleated sheet, and the anti-parallel chain pleated sheet in different parts of the globular molecule. So that secondary structure of proteins, that problem was solved. Well, this was This was already after the war. During the Second World War, I worked, uh, I have the, uh, I think I was the responsible investigator on 14 uh, contracts from the Office of Scientific Research and Development on various problems. Uh, most of them worked out pretty well, too. To be. In, I had met in 1926 and 1927, uh, my wife and I were going visiting in, in uh, Gertingen. He had gone to England after getting his bachelor's degree in chemistry in Harvard. Uh, he had done a little work with Bridgman on the high pressure. The high pressure works, yes. Mm -hmm a little experimental work, and uh, he went to England for a while, didn't like it, I'm not sure that he was a student, and then he went to Göttingen for a couple of years, I worked with Born, his thesis was on the born oppenheimer principle, the, the relating to molecules, which Oppenheimer may have been interested in because of his background in chemistry. Oh, yes. So I saw him there, uh, at him, for the first time in Göttingen, and then when he came to Pasadena, he, uh, my wife and Oppenheimer and I were together a great deal for a year or more, and uh, went to the desert, we often went to the desert in the north. Youngest son, who was with us. And uh, uh, during that period, Dr. Oppenheimer went with us occasionally. Oh, yeah. In uh, 1942, I think it was, or perhaps 43, he came to Pasadena and asked me to come to Los Alamos. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was uh, he was organized. the head of the chemistry section. Mm -hmm. He, the chemistry section insisted that he was having some troubles, I judge, with it and wanted me to come. Uh, but uh, I decided that I shouldn't do it. I didn't do it. Oh, yes. I think largely because of these several contracts that I have with the government. Yes, you had your hands full with all those other right. contracts, uh, too. Yes. Uh, well, that uh, that is a uh, a fascinating uh, story of how uh, your uh, your your work on uh, very simple atoms uh, uh, got more complicated into more complicated structures. Uh, yes. Uh, ending up essentially uh, with the essentially the discovery of the alpha helix and uh, that sort of thing. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, I thought that, that I would to work out the structure of. DNA. Yes. And uh, started to work on it rather desultorily, mm -hmm. I suppose. Yeah. Uh, later on, my wife said to me, if that was such an important problem, why didn't you work harder at it? Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's always very easy to say uh, in hindsight. Yeah. I can remember when I first took organic chemistry, we, uh, we were supposed to isolate some organic compound from a naturally occurring substance, some took cysteine from hair, you know, type of thing, and, uh, and uh, I, I uh, took uh, uh, nucleic acid from brewer's yeast, as a, and at that time, as I remember, we couldn't figure out any, any use for nucleic acid or what role it was, but there was a lot of it in brewer's yeast, so that was a very simple thing. And, uh, yes. But what a, uh, 
what a revolution in the last 50 years has yes. uh, come, come about. Yes, that's right. It's, yeah. As a matter of fact, probably quite a, revel, uh, a, a real understanding of that is probably might prove to be almost more revolutionary than any anything in the last hundred years. Uh, yes, the uh, no doubt the sequences of nucleotides in the rulers yeast nucleic acid uh, overlap a lot with those in human beings yeah. because one protein, several proteins have been studied. Cytochrome C from rulers yeast has uh, polypeptide chains with a hundred amino yeah. acid residues yeah. yeah. and uh, 50, about 50 of them are identical with those in human cytochrome C. Yeah. And so no doubt yeah. the corresponding nucleic yeah. acid, the gene, has yeah. The, uh, yeah. a, a great deal of homology with the human uh, gene yes. for cytochrome C. Well, uh, coming from that particular point, uh, then you, you've uh, broadened your interest uh, even uh, further, you might say, into uh, uh, larger, uh, larger, more complex systems than you. And could you say something about uh, your uh, your uh, how you developed your interest in uh, in the uh, medical and health field? Uh, yes. Uh, All right. Well, of course, this had developed already back in the 30s when oh, yes. I began work on hemoglobin. Yes. In 1936, I gave a seminar talk on hemoglobin at the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research, Grand Rounds. Uh, Carl Weinsteiner, who was a member of the Rockefeller Institute, he had discovered the blood groups in 1900 and had been in one. some 20 years earlier, or 30 perhaps, had got his job at the Rockefeller Institute and was doing work in immunology, immunochemistry. He asked if I would come with him to his laboratory after my talk, and I did. And he said that he hoped that I would think about the experiments he was carrying out and see if I could explain the results he was getting. I, I started, I got a copy of his book and thought about the problems of uh, interest in antibodies and antigens. And in 1940, uh, by 1940, I had developed a theory of the interaction, the structure of antibodies and the nature of the interactions with uh, homologous antigens, hep counts. And in 1942, uh, the same year, I wrote a paper, a short paper, with Del Brick, saying, in which he said that the same sort of interactions are responsible for the gene, that the gene consists of just as an antibody and antigen are complementary in structure. The gene consists of two strands that are mutually complementary, such that they are separated. Each can form act as a template for uh, forming a replica of the other one. Uh, this was, I think, the first time that this had been said clearly. Yes, the, the, the template, the concept. The, the is, template concept. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, the template concept went back somewhat earlier. What we had done, my students and I, in the period of 19, what we did then in the period of 1940 to 1948 was to prove this without doubt. Uh, we did it by taking chemical groups that we knew all about, and, such as the benzoic acid yeah. group. And the, uh, we could put different substituents on a chlorine atom or a methyl group or something else in various places and also use various other groups instead of a carboxylate negatively charged group have a positively charged group. We were able to show by hundreds, thousands of separate uh, experiments that uh, the antibody fits tightly around the heptanic group, uh, that the uh, degree of approximation is to a, a fraction of an atomic diameter. A 
fifth, perhaps, of the metonic diameter. And that uh, if there's a positive charge in the hepton, there's a negative charge in the antibody. If there's a hydrogen bond forming group that presents a hydrogen, there's a complementary group that presents the electron pair in the antibody, and so on. All of these uh, specific aspects of complementariness we were able to verify by experiments with the antibodies. So that uh, I was able then to reach the conclusion that the basic uh, structural, the, the structural basis of biological specificity is a detailed complementariness in molecular structure. That this applies throughout whole biology, explaining the specificity of enzymes, you know, catalyzing chemical reactions, and specificity of antibodies in the combination of antigens, and the specificity of genes in the production of uh, proteins. Then, when I was a member of the Committee on Medical Research that wrote the section on medical research in the Bush Report in 1945, to President Roosevelt, yes. uh, a report about what the federal government can do about science and medicine. I learned about the disease of anemia. Oh, yes. And then I immediately had the idea that uh, the uh, disease is not a disease of an organ or of a cell. Uh, Birkhoff in Germany, a hundred years earlier had said that there could be cellular diseases, diseases of cells, but that it was a disease of a molecule, yes. that the hemoglobin molecule was different from the molecules in hemoglobin in other people, and it was something like an antigen and an antibody, that it had two mutually complementary structures, so the two hemoglobin molecules would attach and the third one, the fourth one, giving a long chain, a uh, long rod, that these would line up side by side through member bulbs attraction, forming a long needle-like crystal, which as it grew longer and longer, exceeding the diameter of the red cell, would twist the red cell out of shape, oh, yeah. making it sticky and causing the uh, cells to aggregate and block the capillaries and lead to the crises and the disease. And, uh, uh, so, as soon as I had thought of that, while uh, was talking, Castle, William Castle, uh, when he got to the end of his sentence, uh, uh, said, do you think that this could be a disease of the world? But they are yeah. He said, I don't know. I said, would it be all right if I looked at some hemoglobin from sickle cell patients to see? And he said, well, what is there to stop you? And so, well, one thing to stop me was where I would get the blood. Another member, Castle was a member of this committee. Another member of the committee was. Uh, uh, Professor in uh, Washington University, later in, in the Catholic University in St. Louis, what is his name? He wrote to me saying that a student of his 